speaker is right here, Kevin Rich, and his abstract is on page number 88 and 89. Kevin actually overlapped with me in the group there, uh, and uh, he was there between 88 and 89. 89. 89. Yeah. 899, I think. Yeah. And uh, uh, Kevin uh, is at uh, the uh, Center for, Center for Management and Biology, Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, University of Texas, uh, Houston. And uh, he's going to be talking about G protein copper receptor. Interacting with the heterotrimeric G protein to cause 
by nucleotide exchange, uh, also in the nucleotide metabolism portion, but also in the desensitization pathway, which involves a kinase and a binding protein called arrestin, which are responsible for attenuating the signal that arises uh, from light activation of rhodopsin. And then also in the recovery phase, where you want to deactivate the GTP bound form of the G protein, deactivate that. And so basically, what the things that we're primarily interested in in my laboratory are structural changes that occur in rhodopsin between the dark and light activated state, as well as structural changes that occur in the G protein alpha subunit as a consequence of interacting with the light activated receptor uh, to trigger the release of bound GDP and the uptake of GDP. So to show this a little bit more schematically, so as has been mentioned earlier, there are three dimensional structures that are available. Shown on the upper left here is rhodopsin with the cytoplasmic region shown in red. So this would be the region which is responsible for the interaction with the heteroprimeric G protein as well as kinase and, and arrestin. Um, down on the bottom here is shown the G protein heterotrimer. So the alpha subunit shown here in yellow with the bound GDP shown here in purple the, and then the beta gamma subunits. So what we're interested in, in understanding is so when light strikes rhodopsin and the 11 cis retin chromophore undergoes a cis to trans isomerization and causes a structural change in the protein. How this, the, the retinal is bound in this transmembrane region, how this is transmitted to the cytoplasmic surface such that it interacts with regions on the G protein. And as Wayne mentioned, the C terminus is a major interaction site, which has been, as Dave mentioned, has actually been modeled on the structure through uh, NMR studies on a peptide. And there's also some work out there that suggests it interacts with the end terminus. How this interaction with the surface regions is translated to the GDP binding blocking to release the amount of GDP. So these are some of the questions that we've been asking. What are the contact points between the R star, which is the light activated form of the receptor, and the G protein? How are changes on the cytoplasmic surface transmitted through surface regions? And then how does this cause release of? of bioluminescent nucleotide. And so we want to know if we can use high resolution NMR to answer some of these questions. So biochemically, this is what, what happens. So you have the interaction of light activated rhodopsin with the GDP bound heterotrimer to form this complex. The release of bound GDP to form an empty complex. The uptake of GDP to form this GDP bound complex. And note that this is still a heterotrimer. And then the subsequent uh, release of GT alpha GTP from R star and also from beta gamma, and then R star is free to go back. So what we want to do is use isotope labeling methods to track and high resolution NMR to track changes in the structure of G alpha at these various discrete steps. And what's nice is we can accomplish that through the use of one nucleotide analogs, or there's a very rich history of rhodopsin mutants which had been generated um, in Gobin's laboratory over the years, which can, in a, in a very nice paper, which was co-authored by Tom Zachmar and Roland Franke and Peter Hoffman, along with Gobin, where they discovered various mutants of rhodopsin that bind but failed to activate transducer. And we've used some of those. I'm not going to go into details of those studies, just to say that we've used some of these mutants along the way. So one of the problems that we have to deal with here is what matters in, in NMR work is size. So uh, rhodopsin is fairly large, so 40 kilodalton if it's a monomer. Um, the G protein, the alpha subunit itself, is 40 kilodalton. And when it's in complex with beta gamma, it's 85 kilodalton. So we're kind of pushing the envelope in terms of, of using NMR for some of these approaches. But as I want to reiterate here, what we're doing is just tracking changes in the structure of G alpha, because this is where all the action is. And so we get, we get around this by just isotope labeling G alpha. And so that is 40 kilodaltons and a little bit more in the manageable realm. So I just want to highlight a couple of things that we've, um, this work was very slow 
at the beginning because we have a lot of difficulty in expressing sufficient amounts. You need milligram amounts of isotope labeled protein for an NMR. And it had been shown for some time that GT alpha, which again is 40 kilodons, so this is the alpha segment transduced in alpha and found in the retina, is not really amenable to overexpression in the soluble form in E. coli. You can make a lot, but it goes to inclusion bodies. And we didn't want to have to deal with uh, trying to refold this. And but Heidi Ham's group and Nick Artenia's group had shown that they could make various chimeras that are composed of the amino and carboxyl terminal segments of G and T alpha. So again, these are the receptor interacting regions, two of the main regions. And internal sequences from GI, which is another G protein alpha subunit subtype. And what's nice is they exhibit many, they exhibit many of the GT alpha-like biochemical properties. And what I mean by that is, is that different G alphas have different rates of basal nucleotide exchange. And since we want to look at only receptor initiated or triggered wanting to do the type of change, it's very important to have a very quiet genome. And this one his tag version, which uh, was generated in Heidi's group, which is known as Chi-6, Chi has virtually identical properties to GT alpha, uh, even though it's a chimera with GI alpha. But again, uh, this while it's very good for biochemical studies, one cannot generate large amounts of the protein um, when you isotope label, which requires minimal media for formulations. And rich media is like LB, you can get you know, a couple hundred micrograms, but you're never going to get uh, significant amounts in, in minimal media, although we did, we were able to at one point. So we tried many different approaches to generating this. I just want to talk about this one that worked actually quite well. We've tried it with many different proteins now. Um, this is, so at the time before when I started this work, I was in Maryland, and a uh, colleague of mine, Phil Bryan, had worked for many years on subtilisin and its interaction with the proto-main region of subtilisin. So proto-subtilisin is made as a pre-pro-enzyme, the pre for secretion, Protomain, actually 77 amino acids, actually helps subalysin fold. And once subalysin is folded and active, it actually cleaves off this protomain region. So he had found that he could take this protomain region, which is now actually this technology is commercialized and it's actually called Profinity Exact. But he could take this protomain region and put it upstream of various proteins, and it, it significantly enhanced their soluble overexpression in E. coli. And what's nice is this proto-main region, which has been somewhat modified, um, still retains nanomolar affinity for subtilisin. But as many of you know, subtilisin is a non-specific protease and can cleave many places. And obviously, we didn't want that to happen. So he had engineered a subtilisin mutant called S189 that recognized specifically this FKAL sequence. And what it, what it does is, is is allows the interaction type binding with cell lice, but then it only cleaves and it's generating your protein without any additional tag on it. And it can be, I should mention that obviously here we have a methionine, but it, we've tried it with many different small regions of proteins and it works. Uh, it still recognizes this sequence quite well. So basically what we were able to do is, is generate a proto, proto main or profinity exact a fusion with our G alpha chimera. And this is schematically showing what we do. So here is a, a sephiroth speed with bound S189 cell lysin on there. So what you do is you inducibly express using the T7 system, your profinity exact tag G alpha and E. coli, take the soluble extract, pass it over the immobilized cell lysin. The only thing that's going to bind to this is your protomate. The exact and I should also mention that this mutant has been engineered so that it's a slow, slow cleaning subtilisin mutant. And so the only thing that will bind is your protein, and you have sufficient time to wash. And you can either wait, or there are ways to actually trigger cleavage. And basically, what happens is your full length protein is what comes on. So no more tags. And this is just showing a chromatogram. Um, this is using a, pro, uh, a Profinia purification system where we can apply it um, and then just 
uh, here we're actually using a trigger to elute it, uh, this chloride trigger, and you basically get your protein peak at the end. And this is just going through the purification scheme. Basically, so we have our fusion, which is up here, and then these are just different steps along the way. And then here's our eluted material, which is about 8 kilodalton shorter than the initial fusion. And it co-migrates with GT alpha. And what's nice is we can generate about 6 milligrams of soluble, uh, fully intact isotope labeled G alpha chimera from L1 eluted. So we're now in the realm of where we can do NMR. We can show that it's functional using an old Gil Gil uh, Al Gilman assay, where you mimic the GTP or the transition state by adding aluminum fluoride to the GDP bond state. And you can see this increase in fluorescence, which is due primarily to tryptophan fluorescence at 207, which is in the GDP binding pocket. So this is in the absence of aluminum fluoride. This is with aluminum fluoride. And then here's the negative material here. So it's very similar behavior. So now we, um, we can generate lots of this material. I just want to highlight a few things. So, so most of the work that we've been doing so far has been N15 labeling. Uh, we have done some C13 labeling as we go into assignments and stuff like that. So what we're looking at in these NMR spectra are amide nitrogen protons. And this is just a, a crystal structure of G alpha. So we're looking at all these different white balls. And so that, just to make things simple, they obviously represent different amino acids in the, that are present roughly in the protein. And so each one of them is in a different chemical environment. So they're going to give you a different chemical shift when one looks at the NMR spectra. Now I just want to point out here that this is where we started. So this was our histag chimera. And we can see that it was very lousy compressed spectra. Whereas our, our uh, protein, which we could generate through this subtle isen technology, which is tag-free, gave a very nice uh, dispersed spectrum. And this is a one-dimensional spectra here. And then shown down below here is a two-dimensional spectra. If you remember, this is a 40 kilodalton protein. Um, there's a lot of clustering of of resonances in this two-dimensional spectrum. And this is something that we're actually um, uh, using other labeling techniques so that we can actually get greater dispersion of these peaks. But obviously the goal is we want to essentially assign all these processes to various amino acids and protein so that we can come up with an NMR structure for what it looks like. But needless to say, we can generate a fairly decent spectrum. And I just wanted to show you that in the show in the NMR group that it responds, or in the biochemical assay, that the protein responds to aluminum fluoride. We can also see that in the NMR tube. So we can show that this alpha subunit is functionally active in the NMR tube. And so in the blue is a 2D spectrum of N15 labeled G alpha in the GDP bond state, overlaid with the aluminum fluoride activated state. And one can see that some peaks do not change, but there's also a number of ones that do change. And I just want to focus on down here in B on a couple things. So there are three tryptophan residues in this G alpha. There's one at position 127, which is in the helical domain region of G alpha. So there's a helical domain and a GTPase domain. And there's also tryptophan 254 and tryptophan 207, which are in the GTPase domain, tryptophan 207 being quite close to the GDP. And what we can see is that in response to aluminum fluoride atom formation, while well, tryptophan 127 doesn't change much, which one would expect since it's in the helical domain, 254 and 207 show significant shifts in their chemical shift. So we can show by NMR that we can monitor dynamic changes in the G alpha. So I just want to point out a few things. We can also look at the heterotrimer. So we can reconstitute G alpha with unlabeled beta gamma subunits. So we have 85 kilodaltons, but only G alpha is labeled. And we can look at changes that occur on beta gamma subunit interaction. And we've, this is all published, so I don't need to go through it, but we've come up with some thoughts about how uh, beta gamma may pre-organize or uh, uh, prime G alpha for interaction with the receptor. We've also taken it through various steps along this pathway. And just to show that we can actually generate the end product, GTP gamma S, 
and we've also uh, characterized um, uh, look at differences between the GDP month state and the GTP MS month state. So obviously what we need to do now is we can we can look at this by NMR in various states, but we really need to assign the protein. And I just want to just mention very briefly that one of the ways that we're going about this, there's several different ways I'm not going to talk about, but we can actually um, we've actually taken somewhat of a dissection approach. So if you remember, it's a gene alpha is actually two domains, the local domain and the GTPase domain. So we can use the same technology to express the G alpha uh, local domain, or we on the GTPase domain now. We can purify it. Here's the precursor protein here. Here's the purified protein. We can get a lot of this. And we can actually get a very nice spectrum, which we can assign, or the which we have assigned for the uh, G alpha. And what's nice is if you overlay with the full spectrum of G alpha, one can see that there are a number of peaks which don't change. So it allows us to facilitate assignments of the whole G alpha just based on this G alpha. So you have an example here. Here's the strip of 127 here. So we're also doing this with the GTPA's domain now. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this since Wayne talked about it quite elegantly. I just want to say that um, site